Thank you for joining me again at Ketamine Clinics of Los Angeles. This is our Friday afternoon, 3 p.m. discussion of ketamine and what's new and what's different in ketamine. And um, this week I've got a couple things to chat about. First, I wanted to mention I was fortunate enough to be interviewed and my patients to be interviewed on uh, CBS News. And it was broadcast on Wednesday afternoon. It's Whereas I hope it was in your market. It was in a lot of markets. If you don't want to see it and you don't have a CBS affiliate near you, you can look at it on our website. We have a link. Uh, and I was very grateful for the coverage, and I'm very grateful to hear ketamine spoken of as a really important therapeutic agent for depression and for suicidality. On the other hand, I have to tell you folks, uh, they start out with, Ketamine, the club drug, may have benefits for depression. Well, you know, that's getting a little tiresome. Ketamine is a therapeutic agent. It's an anesthetic. It's used millions of times every year, literally. It's the most widely used anesthetic in the world. It's also a great, great elevator of mood and great treatment for people with suicidal ideation. It's also very good for chronic pain. There are people who use it as an intoxicant. There are people who, out of a desire for fun, I'll lay that up to you, or a desire to self-medicate because they're feeling kind of bad, do use ketamine in unapproved, unsupervised, recreational settings. That's the tail, not the dog. It's really tiresome to hear it mentioned that way. Anyway, they also say, oh, it's not FDA approved. Ketamine is an approved drug. Depression is not an approved indication. I remind you, more than one out of five prescriptions written in the United States are written for unapproved uses. Ketamine is in very good company. They say it's very expensive. Well, in our clinic, a full series of infusions, that's six infusions, Soup to nuts, everything included, is $3,900. Well, that is a lot of money. But it palls by comparison with lost wages, with lost production at work, with occasionally having to pay for funerals. When you look at what medical care costs today, that is an absolutely reasonable and appropriate cost. They also say the APA isn't enthusiastic about it. Well, they didn't read the March 1st article in the Psychiatry Journal of the American Medical Association, where the American Psychiatric Association specifically acknowledges the benefits of ketamine for depression. So I'm really grateful that CBS mentioned me. It's really nice, and they got some amazing footage of a patient of mine and his wife talking about two patients of mine, actually. One, a young woman who's just done spectacularly well, been able to go back to school, got a better job, and she's thrilled with her results. Another, a, uh, an older gentleman who had been a sculptor and a, um, an actual blacksmith and had really kind of involuted into not doing anything with anyone and it was really impacting his life, of course, and his marriage, too. He wasn't getting out. He wasn't. Anyway, they came in and spoke really poignantly, really authentically and elegantly. Anyway, it was nice to have them on, and it's nice to get a sense of what ketamine can do for people in enhancing their lives and the lives of those who love them. So, on just this week, the journal Nature, a very highly respected journal of science, published online an article on ketamine from a very different point of view than we, we see it. It has One of the findings is ketamine is good for depression. Well, that's silly. That doesn't mean anything in this, in this group. We know that. The difference is they analyzed the FDA adverse events reporting data. They analyzed 8 million plus records. They found 279,000 plus records containing reference to ketamine. And by 
analyzing the omissions in a very novel way, they were able to determine the ketamine really works very well for depression, much better than the SSRIs, much better than the SNRIs, much better than any of the conventional agents for the treatment of depression. It also seems to work very well for suicidality. And as a separate analysis, it seems to really reduce the use of other pain medicines when it's used to treat chronic pain. So that, those findings aren't surprising to you, but we have had all, all kinds of complaints from naysayers about how we just don't have enough N in our data, too few patients. Well, this was 8 million patients, 279,000 plus administrations of ketamine over, I think, about 10 years. So this is a large N, and this is adverse events data. It's pretty objective data. So this is a nice finding. Also, just as an aside, this is a very novel way to analyze. We've been looking for a way to get large-scale data on ketamine that wouldn't cost a fortune to do in order to get the FDA to extend its approval of ketamine, which it already, of course, has done, but to approve it for other indications, indications other than anesthesia. This may be, it's a little early to say, but I'm looking into, the, and others are looking into, this may be a route to getting the FDA to consider uh, endorsing ketamine for uh, this indication. It certainly demonstrates that ketamine is safe. They did find occasional difficulties with uh, renal function, and this harks back to the, the community of abuse, the recreational community, that uses large amounts of ketamine over long periods of time, they do tend to have renal and bladder problems. We don't know how many because they don't come forward and speak to us because they're afraid of being incarcerated. I think the, the data is, is very interesting and it's a substantial number of patients. And just for those naysayers who might say, yeah, okay, so it works and doesn't cause bad outcomes, but it doesn't last. Uh, just to kind of bring it back to that other sticking point that people love to throw when you address some of the other concerns uh, that they might have. Uh, I know it's, it's on my mind because I know we just scheduled a patient um, who we haven't seen in quite some time. Do you want to briefly share with our viewers how long it's been since this patient has uh, had treatment? Yes, yeah, she called um, and she wanted to, um, she wanted to come in for boosters. And we had a little trouble finding in our, her in our record because she was one of our early patients. It was before we adopted our current uh, electronic medical record. But of course, we did find her. And she had her uh, last infusions in April of 2015. So a two plus year run. And she said she's be really been doing well until about the last six or seven weeks. I think that's pretty good. <laughs> it's amazing, and I mean, obviously, that, that's not everybody. Yeah, it's worth pointing out. We don't pretend that that's what people should expect. We never tell patients that they should uh, expect or that even an average is anything close to that. But it's pretty amazing. That's the longest I can recall ever hearing of someone's uh, benefit. And I know we've had uh, you know a good number of patients who've gone over a year, but that's pretty remarkable. Lots of folks over a year. This is the first I can recall over two years. Yeah, that's uh, very cool. Very happy for her and glad that, you know, she can call us to come back as, uh, as needed. I really like talking to you people about this. It's a topic dear to my heart. I really want to make inroads in the depression and suicidal community. Please send me your questions. Please send me any inquiries that you have. This is not a club drug. It's not a novelty. This is a life-saving treatment. Make yourself, make it part of your toolbox for taking care of those you're involved with who are depressed or suicidal. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mandel. And
Uh, we actually just got a good question before we wrap up um, from Lisa Jandati, and thanks for um, being a loyal uh, subscriber here, Lisa, and for tuning into these. We always love to see you watching. And uh, Lisa's asking, uh, she's curious if for the two-year patient, is she getting a single booster? And I think that's a really great question. That's a good question, Lisa. What we've told her is that we would like to her to calendar six as though she was starting from scratch so that there will be room on the calendar for her at the right intervals if she needs it. We're anticipating two infusions for her. But I don't know the answer to the question, how many will she really need to get back to where she was? I will... I'll stay tuned. I will let you know. Now, in your experience, uh, generally speaking, do you find that the longer amount of time that passes between uh, boosters and the initial series, the, the more uh, of a chance that the patient might need an additional infusion or two beyond our, our regular uh, booster? Well, it's an interesting thing. One would think, or I would think, the longer the interval, the more they're going to need. But it turns out that people coming for boosters have more mileage with each pair of boosters. So the interval between boosters actually grows as people become, as people benefit from this medicine. So I, I'm not going to speculate on how many infusions or boosters somebody is going to need as a function of time since last booster because we really don't have the data. I'm very excited to treat people and to see. I mean, I'm always thrilled to see someone who didn't need to come in for 15 months or 18 months. But I don't have any data on how many it takes to get them back to where they were and how long that lasts. Well, it varies so widely patient to patient. There's so many other factors to consider, right? I mean, people, you know, have a, often a life event is what prompts their return. You know, there's a, a, pat, a loss of a loved one, a job change, relationship change, yeah. or something that occurs, and it's also been months since they've been here, and a, a combination of things ha causes them to return. So many, many different um, factors. And it's one of the things that makes, uh, I think, you know, mental health so interesting and so challenging to address is just how many things really do come into play. Yeah, that's right. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate everyone for tuning in. Uh, we will put a link to the article that Dr. Mandel spoke about uh, in Nature in the description of this video. I encourage everyone to take a quick look at it. We'll also include a link to our CBS coverage if you haven't seen that yet. It's a very brief piece, uh, despite some of the information that we don't feel like may have been worded as well as it could have been. Uh, we are grateful. It is good. It is informative. And best of all, you'll get to hear from our patients who uh, have really had their lives transformed by this treatment, and they share very uh, genuinely, and we're grateful to them for that. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week, 3 p.m. Friday afternoon.